I just kind of wanted to start out by um, talking a little bit about Mark because I feel very lucky that he came into my life. He's been a fantastic mentor and it's because of him that I was able to do my research on exactly what I wanted to do. Um, my also thanks him because he shaved off about two years of grad school for me because uh, I got a secondary data set and was able to finish my dissertation really quickly. So um, he's been a really great teacher and he's been so forthcoming with information and really interested in my development and I, um, I just feel so lucky to be able to be doing this work with him. So a shout out to Mark. Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about my dissertation. I'm not going to get too far into the results because I presented this in Miami, but I'm happy to share more details about that part of the study with you guys offline. If you guys want to see the slides from that or even read my 140 page, uh, very soporific uh, dissertation about it, I'm happy to share it with you. So. Um, and the other thing is, feel free to interrupt me with questions and comments. I really want to cultivate a... Okay, anyway, so feel free to interrupt me. Um, I really kind of want to cultivate a discussion about this work because it's, it's very important for me to understand the theory deeply and in an academic way. So I'm interested in hearing what you guys have to say about it and ideas that you have for, for further studies. Um, I do want to contextualize everything I say from here forward with the fact that, in my opinion, uh, research isn't fact. Um, this is just another data point for understanding. So I want to contextualize the work. Um, I think our, um, our data is only as good as the tools we use to measure. Um, and so we need good tools to measure, number one. But we also have to keep in mind the, the limitations of the tools that we're using. Um, and I'm happy to share some reliability and validity studies on Mark's assessment. Um, I'm not going to get too far into that today just because that might drown you with numbers. I'm probably already going to do that, so. Um, so I'll start with the research questions for part one. Um, my three research questions were, what were the significant profiles in terms of auxiliary and, uh, sorry, superior and auxiliary functions in terms of function and attitude and process? I kind of wanted to know, what does that um, pair look like? Um, the second one was looking at the top three most reported functions. So not the tertiary as we would classically think about it in MBTI, but just the third highest T-score for their eight functions. And then the last thing was how does the superior function compare to the inferior function? Is it diametrically opposed like Jung said or not? Um, why am I interested in studying this? Because for me at this point, I, I feel like I can't apply the theory well unless I know what I'm working with first and I'm not um, proficient enough to qualitatively type people super accurately at this point, so I use a tool. And I feel like I need a good tool to do that, and uh, in order to build a good tool, we have to have a solid understanding of theory, which is kind of where this comes in. What, what are the actual types? That's the foundation, how the nomenclature and the taxonomy of type works. So that's where my curiosity kind of um, found a home. So the methodology. So uh, males and females between the ages of 20 to 80. This came from Mark's Australia, US, and Canada samples um, from both the PTE and the PPI. Mm -hmm. You're referring to Mark. Do you mean Mark Majors? Mark Majors. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> yes, Mark Majors from the US. Um, the PTI is a longer version of the PT. Sorry, the PTE is a longer version of the PTI, but they're the same kind of questions and have the same kind of structure. It was actually one of the limitations of my analysis was that I kind of lumped them both together. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and I can talk more offline about the nuances that it might have, uh, how it might have affected the data. Um, the method I used was latent class analysis, which is a fancy form of cluster analysis. It, I basically give the computer a bunch of data and say, tell me what you find in terms of homogeneous and significant clusters of data. And then it gives me these classes that it pulls out. That's a very watered down version of 
weight class analysis. And so the total end for the entire study with all four parts was 9,480. For the dissertation, which was part one, was about 4,900. Do you guys have any questions about that? Um, so important also is uh, to talk about how I define complementarity. Um, basically, I took a pretty black and white approach to it based off of what Jung said. If it wasn't antagonistic, it was complementary, which meant that something like any with D was considered complementary, even though it's not, um, in the way we classically think about complementarity, it's not how, um, how we think about it. Um, and so by definition, then, antagonistic was directly oppositional, so the antithesis of. So essentially, um, extroverted intuition with introverted sensing. OK, so a flashback from Miami. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the results, but I just want to contextualize um, where we are in this, at this point in the presentation. Um, we ended with thinking that I needed some post hoc tests to explore the composition of the classes that I found in terms of gender, age, occupation, and all of those sort of contextual variables. And then um, because I, I'll talk more about this later, but because I collapsed the T-scores into a rank, so I turned it into categorical data, uh, I lost a lot of information about the spread and the variance and the mean of the scores. And so I wanted to go back and look at the continuous data, meaning the T-scores themselves, and see what that told me about the different classes. So that's where we ended in Miami. Um, part two research questions were um, basically, uh, I got um, a second data set of about 5,000 and combined that with the original data set of about 4,000 and then I got the whole data set which I mentioned earlier. Part two was just that second uh, data set. And so my question was, I basically replicated exactly what I did. How did these two data sets compare? Um, part three was, again, the, the categorical data as a whole, and then part four was the, the, the entire data set with continuous. So I know this is a lot of statistical mumbo jumbo, but it'll make sense in a, in a second. Um, and then part four, um, another part of the research question was, um, what can I tell about the composition of the classes from the continuous data and the different profiles that I found? So I looked at some descriptive statistics about that. OK, so just to talk a little bit about this in case you're lost. Um, categorical versus continuous are measures of um, types of data. When the, the data is ranked, um, it's basically, so we had a, a spread of eight scores, and maybe we had like 75, 65, 55, 45, 35, and so on. I turned them into ranks, so number one. And those were scores were for each of the functions and their attitudes, yes, right? So exactly. the eight function attitude combos? Yes, because we're extroverted sensing, extroverted intuiting, and so on. Um, and so I basically got one through eight, eight being the most, the highest score of the set and one being the lowest. Um, by definition, you lose a lot of the richness of the data when you do that. And so one of the things I wanted to do this time around was to go back and put it into the continuous scores, which was you know, 75, 65, 55. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good. Okay. <coughs> All right, so this is just to sort of help orient each of the different parts of the study because it's a bit complicated. Again, part one was my dissertation study uh, with the N of about 4,600. Part two was that new half of about 5,200. Part two was part one and two put together in the categorical um, data. And then part four was that same combined data set but in continuous form. Make sense? So the major findings from the categorical data studies, I kind of put it all into one because that's sort of how I differentiate the, the different important pieces of this um, overall study. 90% uh, of the time, we had a rational and an irrational, so I'm using Jung's original language, um, in the superior and the auxiliary position, which I think is pretty interesting because that supports what Jung said, right? Um, and then another interesting finding was that I found that the superior and the auxiliary, even though they were different processes could be the same in attitudes. So you could have extroverted sensing with extroverted feeling. We found that as a common um, profile. But the really interesting thing, I think, was that comparing the auxiliary to the third most reported function, they were always complementary. So it was either the opposite attitude, same function as the auxiliary, or it could have been the uh, opposite attitude, same function as the superior. So just to give you a visual here. <coughs> 
Um, these are sort of some visuals of the, the common profiles of three that I found. And you can see that um, extroverted feeling and introverted feeling supporting that introverted sensing as a superior. Or you balance out the attitude of su the superior function and the third most used function. Um, and you get sort of a, a tripod situation. We talked about that in Miami. So questions about any of that? So you're saying most used. How do people report that? How is the question asked to them? Did they, do you ask them how much do you use the function or not? No. So this is a, a big limitation of the study is that the assessment calculates um, eight t-scores for each of the eight functions based on formula, which relates to how you answer a dichotomously organized assessment. So there's no direct question of, about introverted feeling. There's questions about introversion and feeling, and based off of how you answer those, it calculates a t-score. I don't know what that formula is. I wasn't privy to it. Um, so that's a big limitation, because it would be nice to know how that happened. Uh -huh. but, so, so really, just to put that in context, so for example, for excavated feeling, Somewhere there'll be some questions which relate to excavated feeling, and people will affect get a raw score of that. But then there's a compared with an all group of some description to get what those T scores are. Can you say it one more time? And then those will be compared with a norm group of some description mm -hmm. to turn them into T scores. Mm -hmm. So it'll depend a bit on the norm group and where the norm group is in terms of each of these things. Yeah. Then you then turn those into to a a ranking. Exactly. Well. Yeah. It's just that you know like using it most like, usually the question's more like, what's most like you, or something like, do you know what I mean? It, it's, and people can interpret questions like that in very different ways, and then if you sort of, so if, you, if you're asking someone what's most, most like you, but you're actually then in, in, say, interpreting that as how much you use it, mm -hmm. I mean, I'd rather see them ask what, how much they use it, and then we know that that's what the, that, uh, <laughs> do you know I, what I mean? I don't know. That's not necessarily true. Yeah, Steve Myers in GRI kind of challenges that okay. view. What I find fun about this is that the model on the left, or the, the diagram on the left, supports the MBTI model, and the um, figure on the right supports Jung's original model, the Wheelwright model, and the Graham Johnston model. Hmm. Yeah, I think I, I did read that. One thing to keep in mind, too, is that when I'm calling the tertiary the third most used function, but if we're thinking about it in MBTI terms, it's not the tertiary classic. Um, the tertiary comes much further down in the stack, which I'll actually talk about later. Um, um, I did want to mention that I did get some funny, odd groups where I had essentially three discrete functions, meaning sensing, feeling, and thinking in those top three. Um, it made up about 10 to 15 percent of the data. Um, which I thought was interesting, and uh, it was contextualized a little bit further when I did my follow-up study, so I'll talk more about that um, later on. Okay. So part four, the continuous data study. This is where I think things got really interesting. Um, I wanted to flash up, I know this is a lot of numbers, so I'm going to give you some time to look at it. Um, but basically what this is showing, the top, top graph is the resulting classes for the extroverted feeling group. I got three classes. You'll notice that class one is disproportionately larger than the rest. Um, and then it gives you the t-scores the for each of the eight functions with the caveat that extroverted feeling is eliminated because in order to separate out the subgroups, I essentially controlled for the, the highest t-score function. So that's not, in terms of the calculation of the mean and standard deviation, it's not a part of that spread. Um, but nevertheless, it shows some really interesting information. Um, and what you'll notice is that class one and class two are exactly the same profile, but they're composed of different types of scores. The mean is lower for class one than it is for class two, and the standard, standard deviation, meaning the, the range and the variance in the scores, is also higher. So the reason why this is important is because you've got somebody who's responding maybe uh, got a t-score of 40 on all eight functions versus... Um, maybe the next person who has a highest score of 80 and a lower score of 20. They're very different. They're the same profile, but very different people, right? And so this obviously has implications for assessment and development and all the different, you know, ways that we actually apply the theory. And then the second one, the second graph here is showing um, the top three most used functions, which you've seen before in the diagram. 
Um, but the bottom two pieces show the inferior function, which supports Jung's theory once again um, very strongly. But then this idea of the inferior auxiliary function, which I think in MBTI languages would be called the tertiary. Um, and so also interesting here is that it's <coughs> diametrically opposed to the auxiliary function in both classes. And here it's not, which is also interesting. So just to clarify, if we were referencing this in type code terms, 70% were ESFJ, right? Yes. Conceptually, mm -hmm. and 27% were ENFJ. Yeah, kind of. I mean, it, interesting thing about this one is that yes. it has that funky yes. profile. Uh -huh. Yeah, and interestingly, the um, the classes that I found that had this profile that didn't have that nice JP um, pair in the dominant and auxiliary um, were mostly J. I found very few P profiles with you know two S's in the uh, superior and auxiliary, or two ends in the superior and auxiliary. So, uh, with, with this class, you didn't have a fourth class that had a more traditional ENFJ look? No. Correct. For okay. whatever reason. I mean, it was a large class. I think the N was, for the extroverted feeling, I think it was about 1,200. Okay. So, it's not a small group. Yes. But interesting that I didn't find that profile. Sometimes, when in, in the cluster analysis, what I found was the larger the group, the smaller the number of classes I would get. Unless it was something like introverted sensing, which, for whatever reason, is very clearly the classes were very clearly differentiated in the data. <coughs> Does anybody have thoughts or questions about this? Too many numbers. Okay. okay. So here are the big findings from the continuous part of the study. Uh, the most common profile. So I s expanded it to look at the top four. Most common profiles tended to have a dominant in both attitudes, so, well, that doesn't show it, but um, SI is the dominant, or the superior function, and then maybe SE in the third most used, or the fourth most used, um, but then two opposing functions in the same attitude. What I wrote there, I think that's an error. It should be, um, it should be NE. There's nothing wrong with that, so ignore that. Um, but yeah, a dominant in both attitudes somewhere in that stack of four, and two opposing functions like T or F in the same attitude. So um, maybe SI, FI, SE, and TI was um, a very common profile. I was expecting that I would get um, two functions, so S and N, in both attitudes. Uh, but that's not what I found, actually. I found much more commonly that it was uh, the dominant function in both attitudes and then two functions in the same process, but in both at in the same attitude, which I thought was very interesting. And I think that might have something to do with the mean age of my sample. Um, we've been talking about this a uh, couple days now, but um, and I've been saying at about 40 or 40 or 50, we're at our peak development, we're functioning pretty well, we've got two functions and we can do them in both attitudes and everything's looking pretty good. I think that actually happens a bit later in life. I think at around 40, we get something more like this, which is you've got one very nicely differentiated dominant function and then a supporting auxiliary function in both attitudes. And for all intents and purposes, it's working pretty well for you. Um, and then maybe later in life, if I had a sample that um, the mean age was closer to 50, 60, 70, maybe I would see that nice um, cross uh, profile that I was hoping to find but didn't. Um, as far as the profiles, it was very similar to the categorical data, but again, because I, I de-collapsed the ranked data and put it back into the continuous, I thought, found the same profiles, but with different, um, different numbers, different amplitudes uh, in terms of how they were using their functions. Um, and then again, here in 90% of the classes, the inferior function had a complementary auxiliary function, and also the superior was almost always opposed to the inferior. Um, I asked Mark if that was an artifact of the way that the formula is set up, and his answer was yes and no. Um, part of it is that the more you answer in one direction, the less you score in the other, but the other part of it was that I did found, find in at least 10% of the classes that they weren't antagonistic, which I thought was interesting. Okay, some overall themes. Okay, so largely speaking, results show that the superior and auxiliary tends to be balanced in process. So one J function, one P function, and then the auxiliary and tertiary tends to be balanced in attitude. That was 
true in about 70% of the classes that I found in part one. So that SI with TE and TI, nice little tricycle. What I found in the second part of the study is that after those top three functions are developed, the data gets less clear about the patterns, and that could have, again, to do with test sensitivity or maybe the mean age of the sample. But one thing is very clear, which is that the superior and the inferior bookend are typological development. So what happens in between has a ton of variance, but we know for sure that you know, if you're doing your dominant function, we know what your inferior function is for sure. Um, and according to the data that I found, there are lots of different developmental pathways. Part of the reason why I feel like those classes weren't more present in the analysis was because, you know, if you think about it, once you get past, you know, you've, you've got your superior and your auxiliary pair and you add in a third and you add in a fourth, the number of possible directions you could go in exponentially increases. So, you know, we could have a ton of variance and, you know, our numbers just aren't big enough or our tests are not sensitive to pick it up. It also begs the question, you know, how... How specific and nuanced do we need to be in our understanding of type? Do we need to understand all these different developmental trajectories? Or can we understand enough about you know, the development of your superior and your auxiliary and maybe your tertiary and well enough to help somebody be healthy? Um, so here are some examples of, of some developmental pathways. Uh, what's listed on top is sort of the progression of function development. Obviously, I've listed it in a linear way. I don't think that's actually how it happens. Um, but it's interesting to kind of plot it out. This would be somebody who fluctuates back and forth from developing J and P functions, alter alternating back and forth. Um, I picked eight just because eight, eight and eight makes me happy. Um, and then another example here of somebody who probably does two J functions and then two P functions and then two J functions, so there's less of a, a, a tighter sine wave there. Um, but aside from environmental stressors and factors and the things that happen in life and your work and the person you choose to partner with, what are your thoughts about what bridges the development between these functions? I mean, in some cases, you can see that the attitude bridges the function. In some other cases, you can see that the process bridges the function. They say develop a J and a J function and then links it with the attitude for the next jump. But what are your thoughts about how that happens? or anecdotal evidence from how it happens in your practice. I think we're still I think we're still getting our head round this All right. model. <laughs> in the development then I think it partly depends on what the environment causes you to do to adapt to survive. Mm -hmm. And partly <coughs> the under, underlying attention is drawing you to do this. For me, it's almost like you've got an underlying development path that's trying to unfold, but yet that has to coincide with what you're actually doing and what's needed. So you can depend on the individual think, you know, how, you, how you adapt to it. Yeah, highly specific to the individual. And yet we still have propensities to go in certain directions. You know, set up as paribus. All else being equal, we have sort of organic propensities to go in a certain direction over another. And so that's kind of what I'm really after is, you know, under the same conditions, what, what guides the development of this progression? Um, but it's interesting to think about, you know, what the thing that bridges the, the, the shift, is it the attitude, is it the process? Um, it's almost as if, if you already know how to do one thing, it kind of scaffolds your development to learn how to do another. Okay, some applications. Um, probably some of you remember this from Miami, the tricycle model. It's that um, dominant function. So we move from a bicycle or a motorcycle with two wheels with a superior and auxiliary function to a tricycle. So we've got a, a dominant, um, this should be actually reversed, big wheel in the front. But um, say so introverted sensing is the dominant, and then you've got extroverted thinking and introverted thinking to sort of support the development and um, uh, cognitive function of the individual. The thing that I thought was interesting was thinking about it in a four-wheeler perspective, right? So this is what I hoped I would find. I didn't. Um, but the idea is still interesting. You know, it, it makes a lot more sense to me that, you know, if you already learned Latin, that it would be easier for you to learn Spanish than it would for you to learn Mandarin, right? So it would be much easier for you to learn to do the opposite attitude of a function you already know how to do rather than make this huge jump to a completely new, essentially a new language, right? And so when we think about that four-type stack, it doesn't necessarily flow linearly. I think there's a lot of stuff that happens in between the tertiary and the inferior in terms of MBTI terms. Um, 
Um, but the data supports what Isabel said about the tertiary and the inferior function, um, which was also very really interesting. Okay. So development. In 92% of the classes, the inferior had a complementary inferior auxiliary function, which I, I thought that was really interesting. Um, and so, again, the inferior auxiliary being the tertiary in typical MBTI language. So I'm curious to know, like, what does that tell us about healthy development of the inferior function? Um, I thought I might share an anecdote. My dad, so my type, I have been currently testing INTJ. My dad's an ESFP, so he's my diametrical opposite. And so I started thinking about what does it look like to learn how to use the inferior function in a healthy way? How do I develop it? How do I develop it? And I don't think it's, it can be sort of decontextualized. It happens in, in the context of its auxiliary function, just like the superior functions in the context of the auxiliary as well. So I started thinking, like, what's it like to hang out with my dad? I actually, um, I love hanging out with him. We, I think we both experience a sense of like mutual release, because with him, I can be sensory and go with the flow. And with me, he can be sort of more abstract and um, we just get along really well. And so um, on your tables, there's a handout. I kind of wanted you guys just to talk a little bit about, think about your diametrically opposed type. Have you ever met anybody with those um, preferences and what's it like to interact with them? Have you sensed, you know, have you butted up against your inferior function? Um, have you uh, pleasant, have a pleasant experience with somebody of your opposite type? Has it been terrible? I just kind of want to talk about that for a little while. Can you switch on? Yep. Yeah, so right there. Uh, so did you guys think of uh, anything interesting come out of the discussion that you want to share? Mine But once the bridge is there, you know, it, it works really nicely. Um, I think another table is talking about it matters when the person and in what context the person comes into your life. Um, I met my dad when I was born, so it's probably more like him. Um, but I think Angelina had a friend that she met in her formative teen years, so maybe that has something to do with it too. How many people are married to the opposite type? Just one. Here's the only brave one. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about implications for assessment because I think that's where um, this also has a pretty big impact. Um, so I think the biggest question for me is just what are the, fundament what are the fundamental building blocks for the nomenclature? Uh, I think what I'm really comfortable saying is that I'm sure that everything falls under this category, um, at least as far as you know, their broad two functions. Well, not everything, but um, probably a large majority of it, because we did find some things that didn't really fit this pattern. But this seems like a good foundational building block to build assessments. So I'm just curious to know, you know, what do you think this impacts? How would this impact the way we assess type, if, if anything? Because right now, we tend to lean more towards a dichotomous assessment. Um, and this suggests that there, it should be linked with that secondary function as well. Yeah. Uh, um, so I've actually spent some time thinking about how you might rewrite, like instead of asking an FT question, you might ask an extroverted feeling versus an extroverted thinking question, right? Because if you can once get to the point where you owe, oh, you know that they have an extroverted judging function, maybe instead of asking generic FT questions, 
I can ask specific or contextual FT questions. The same thing uh, with N and S, right? Can I ask if I know that you know they have um, uh, um, there's somebody who's going to have their introverted sensing or introverted intuition? Maybe I should ask the question in a way that's contextually relevant, mm -hmm. so I don't ask an extroverted sensing question to somebody who has likely has introverted perceiving preferences. I want to ask an appropriate contextual question. And so, uh, yeah, I've actually spent some time trying to, uh, um, starting a number of years ago, think through what that might look like if you were to optimize your assessment to think in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because at the fundament of it, the, the thinking is not expressed, decontextualized from its attitude. And thinking from a J-type looks quite different from thinking from a P-type, so that has to affect how we uh, measure it. Um, so just to clarify that, are you saying that you might, in effect, have an adaptive question? Yes. Where there's an initial assessment, and then you have some tailored questions depending on the initial questions? Yep. That's correct. Go straight to adaptive. Yeah. But yeah. you need to be very careful there with the forced choice, because you're introducing a degree of sensitivity, which does not agree in forced choice between two opposites. So right. Interesting technical challenge. But y yes. <laughs> yeah, it means that you have to start also questioning other things too, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> to make sure that it all plays out nicely. Yeah. Yes. You, but yeah, they started asking that question and started looking at what does that mean if you try to think of that way. With the idea that in general you could get to people being able to more uh, confidently identify their type if you've given them that, take that context into account. Yeah, and so kind of coming back to the idea of the developmental trajectories, you know, we can nail down eight definite functions that are, you know, superior, in the superior position, one extroverted, one introverted. But, you know, beyond the auxiliary, you know, we have all these tons of different trajectories that somebody can take. So to me, that means that we need to add a temporal or a developmental component to assessments too, because it's not static. The expression of, you know, the measurement of the function may be in some cases yes and no, but the measurement of the function depends kind of on the, de the person's development of the function in some sense. And so there should be a temporal component, I think, in assessments. It's going to look very different for a young ESTP to take the test than it will for a seven-year-old ESTP. You know, theoretically, at 70, you would probably have developed more of your cognitive function. So I think a, de a developmental aspect to testing uh, is an important idea to consider. some of both Young and Meyer's very fundamental idea that you need to differentiate. So perceiving and judging, or as you call them, um, processes, you need to have one of these. Exactly. And I'd like that these data are showing that. And then you need to differentiate those. So, I think for young people, sometimes the differentiation within the process, so S from N, T from F, can be very difficult. So, I'll try to make it more concrete. Someone who hasn't yet differentiated sensing and intuition may have a great deal of difficulty telling the difference between reality and what they would like reality to be. Because the intuition tells them that this is a possible right. reality, and since they haven't differentiated them, they tell you things that are you know, sometimes lies, but to them are not, because the possible and the real are still enmeshed in them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's an excellent point. It's almost as if the judging function doesn't have something to tether it or contain it or ground it, and it's sort of just kind of willy-nilly. Just It's like a hammer and everything is a nail. <coughs> That kind of, um, you know, talking more about development, at least in, in my practice with my clients, one of the ways that I've approached applying the tricycle model is, you know, when I get sort of a, uh, let's say an ISFJ who's totally burnt out because they spent their whole life taking care of everybody around them, one thing we help them do, I help them do, is to try to develop some of that introverted feeling. So rather than help them do something completely different, I help rebalance that feeling function a little bit. And then the next thing I would probably do is try to help them develop some extroverted sensing so they have that nicely balanced two functions in both directions. Um, in reality, I think you know the development of the functions is not so linear, and there's sort of just sort of a, a cycle and a spiral that happens. But 
generally speaking, I think that's my theory, at least, even though my data doesn't support it. <laughs> um, okay. So some future studies. Um, I think what I want to do is see if the proportions of the profiles have two introverted and two extroverted functions in the top four versus a three and one. Um, my hunch is that attitude has a gravity to it and sort of pulls other functions into its orbit, especially you know when that dominant function is being used uh, pretty much for everything. Um, but I kind of wanted to just, I wanted to see is it is attitude balanced across the four, um, and what does it look like across different age ranges? Um, and then again, you know, looking back at the demographic makeup of the classes, you know, is one class more heavily female? You know, is this class lower in age than the other? Um, to, are they all in a similar type of profession? That's very important demographic data that helps us contextualize all of these findings. And then, you know, obviously the golden question longitudinal studies, true type versus reported type. Again, we're only as good as the tools we're using to measure, and I think multiple points of data over time help us understand how this process works, both in how to assess it and also how people develop. Um, but those are sort of my ideas for where I want to go next. Do you guys have any thoughts? I mean, I have a ton of data, and I could spend probably 10 years turning it this way and that way. <laughs> <laughs> do you have, uh, as well as the scores of the functions, do you have four-letter type? Yes. Is the, mm -hmm. It might be worthwhile uh, doing with in-type norms with functions, seeing what falls out of your analysis there. Say that first. Doing with in type, so renorming the T okay. scores mm -hmm. to be normed within each type. Oh, okay. And then rerunning the data. Yeah, that's a so great idea. Give you a, a standard benchmark within each type to see what's Yeah, going. rather than norm to the entire yeah. population. Yeah, that's a great idea. So my way of goes to um, what would happen if we did narrative research on this rather than quantitative. Yeah. Um, actually, you know, knowing that we've got people with best fit type. Tracking how they, what critical incidents in their lives triggered development of different functions or whatever became, you know, I'm, I'm making this up, which is always hard on an INFJ to just speculate, but uh, figuring out the questions that we get at when the functions actually develop and how and why there might be differences within type. Yeah. <coughs> Do you guys have any other questions about how to apply this data or what it might mean for your practice? And, or maybe share anecdotes about how you can see it applied? I think it makes it easier to just have an open dialogue when somebody's like, well, you know what, I've, I feel like this is my type, but for some reason I you know, feel strongly pulled to this particular function for whatever reasons. Like it, that doesn't feel hard for me, or you know, oh, I, I feel like I can do this. And if, and if you only look at it just the traditional whole type, you might be tempted to um, to walk away from that. But mm -hmm. it, it, it potentially encourages us to have a more open dialogue. Yeah. Oh, well, let's talk about what, why for you. Kind of back to that narrative discussion, Jane, you were talking about. Like, oh, well, why is that function rather than kind of well, that doesn't fit your whole type, so let's not talk about that. Yeah. That's a great point. I'm glad you brought that up. That's actually one of my biggest takeaways from this research is that we should avoid being indoctrinated by our, our model, right? We should think critically about how to use it and apply it. And I think this data really speaks to the nuance um, that's, that exists. And maybe a model doesn't necessarily need to capture because it's too much specificity, but it's still there. And you know, people are individuals and unique. And um, I think this data really encourages us to think in a more broad way about type. It would be interesting to see, say, the standard BB8 functions mm -hmm. in their list and alongside yours, yeah. your two, huh. um, and how they compare, uh -huh. and some thoughts about what implications that has for archetypes. Mm -hmm. what have, is the trickster no longer is what, we thought, what, it, it what it thought? Well, I think the thing the main point of John's model is it's not a quantitative model. It's, it, even though you, draw, you make it into a stack, mm. which seems to give it a hierarchy, he very explicitly says it's qualitative. Mm. He said we've all got all eight functions, but we, we experience each one in, in a different way, qualitatively. We express it emotionally, feel it in a different way, and it comes out with a different character. And that's the point. It's not about ranking them and make, saying this one's bigger or stronger than the other one. It's very much about getting into the personal self-experience of the person which is 
different to objective empirical science, mm -hmm. which is, and I think you need both of those sides to actually work very strongly towards a, a way of combining mm -hmm. those directives. Mm -hmm. And so, with, so you're saying with BB's model, it's less about you know what actual function gets placed in the different <coughs> archetypes, and more about the relationship between the archetypes and how they actually function. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's recognised that it, it, in a particular type, there is a certain pattern in which functions are carried by the, the particular archetypes. Mm -hmm. But it's not about what's bigger, stronger, more developed, most used. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not quantitative. So, if I can reframe that, in, in, in so what you're saying is that, so regardless of how developed the trickster function is for a person, right, that whether it's something they've spent a lot of time developing and they use their trickster function very well, right, or it's something that's very undeveloped and they hardly don't use it or use it poorly, right, that the BB model is talking about how it would be used, right? That it, that that, it, exactly, that, that we talk about like, oh, that function for that type is going to be expressed as a trickster. Right. Well, this model is talking about, hey, how much access, how often, how frequently do they use it? So they're basically talking different things mm -hmm. rather than talking the same thing. Yeah, and so that begs the question. Is like, that what you're trying yeah, to say? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Right. Second, second. Yeah. Very different ways mm -hmm. And it, I guess it kind of begs the question, you know, where do you draw a line between assessment and theory? Because if, if this stuff is saying that maybe the eight functions that we're overlaying on those archetypes is different than what we have traditionally thought it is, <laughs> but the theory is taking a more fixed approach, like how, what's the... How do you bridge the gap between those two things? Like, what if the trickster function isn't the function that we thought it was? It's actually something else. But that's only if you're saying that the trickster, that the one the trickster goes with is the seventh one down, and the seventh one down right. has a meaning in mm -hmm. terms of how developed that is, or you know, right. it's not meant to be that. Right. That's why John draws out the cross, mm -hmm. which is kind of less hierarchical. <laughs> it's it's fine that it doesn't mean that the seventh is the seventh to develop. I get that, yeah. but it's still in the seventh position when calling it the trickster function. The trickster's in that That's position. That's the stack model's quite misleading, and the cross model's actually. More <laughs> in other words, the mistake is calling on the B model, calling it the seventh position. Right. You should instead call it the trickster the position, right? Uh -huh. You call it the trickster position. Yeah. This model is attaching a hierarchy, right? right? One uh -huh. through eight. That model is applying. Almost like we're a circular, or you know, we're like a the so trickster position, the the good parent position, right? There's these. Yeah, the the yeah. There you go. So, it, so, it, so these two don't have any conflict at all. Correct. It's That's chalk what and yes. cheese. Yes, exactly. yes yeah. exactly. Okay. And the only reason John has ever drawn it as a hierarchy stack is because traditional type dynamics has a four stack, mm -hmm. and it's sort of built on that to show people how the other functions work with the existing four of the mm -hmm. type dynamics. Um, that, but then that's confusing because people can't help but see top to bottom as a hierarchical mm -hmm. Okay, thing. but the top four type dynamics, this now confuses me how this relates to standard type dynamics. I don't quite get, because I understand dominant, auxiliary, tertiary, and okay. inferior. So but what this researcher is really saying is that that's untouched, but there's a bunch of stuff in between. So dominance secondary, tertiary, and inferior are essentially here 1, 2, 7, and 8. And there's a bunch of stuff in between, and there's a bunch of different pathways for development to get to that inferior function development. Does that make more sense? So 1, 2, 7, is what Lenore Thompson called her lasagna exactly. model. Exactly. Yep. It's a lot like Thompson's model. Uh, yeah, I never could make sense of that. I <laughs> <laughs> The thing that the concept is there's something ideal energetically about sort of the traditional type development path. Yes, people can develop in different ways. But the key question to them, we would need to ask them, is like, well, how was that for you? How do you feel about that? And like, are you a bit messed up actually as a result of doing that? And that would be the biggest question. You know, like, what's the implication of developing in that way, mm -hmm. given that you might have a type pathway trying to take some. Right. And I think the closer you get to the middle of that stack, the less impactful is different pushes this way and that way get. I mean if, if you're not if you're not given the space to develop your sort of organic dominant function, then I think you're you're in trouble. Right? And then it maybe gets less impactful the further down the stack you get. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm out of material. I'm sorry I rushed through that first half. I'm happy to share some more information about the first part of the study with you guys if you're interested, but I do. Uh, Sorry, I do have one question, yeah, yeah. which 
rule out of the court as being irrelevant um, if you want. But um, I've just recently done the, the PIA assessment, mm -hmm. which looks as uh, which measures reports to measure separately your uh, your preferred and your de demonstrated use of, let's say, extroverted thinking and extroverted, extroverted feeling um, on a scale opposite each other. That's interesting. Um, and, um, and for me, personally, in terms of my own report, it was extremely helpful because it, it illustrated how I was being, I had a preference in one place, but I was being drawn into the opposite kind of behaviour for various very explicable reasons because of work and personal stuff. Sure. Um, and that um, began to speak to me as to uh, why sometimes I felt so tired and mm -hmm. you know, great. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm, I'm really not sure what, what my point is other than saying it feels like the, the, the chairman is trying to draw together some of the um, uh, some of the, the, the useful stuff that the majors yeah. is, is measuring with the more if you like a more traditional sure. um, type approach. So yeah. I don't know if you've got any comment on that. So you're talking about true type versus express type, is that idea? Well, that, yeah, I mean, yes, if you like, yeah. Yeah. Hmm, what do I have to say about that? I think that's it. I mean, it kind of adds another layer of data to assessing type, which I think is very useful because, you know, there's this constant struggle between what am I organically and then how does my environment affect how I express my type? Yeah. And then, you know, is it a chicken or the egg question? Because can you really separate those two things anyway? Yeah. But the I expectation, think, I guess, would be that as you, ch as you change your behaviors, the express type might change, so it might become more comfortable mm -hmm. actually in an appropriate way using my expert mm -hmm. thinking and dialing down my, the pressure I feel to use expert feeling, mm -hmm. um, then actually in five years or two years' time, I might report quite differently on that. Actually, anecdotally, I can say that that's true in my own type journey. I used to test INFJ, and then once I figured out it doesn't fit, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I started doing something else, and then I started testing a different type. So, And it was it was sort of like an eye-opening, like, oh my gosh, like, why am I doing this again? <laughs> you know, of course, I had a mother and a father who were both feelers, so I didn't really have, it wasn't really groomed in my own development. So I can anecdotally support that. Yeah. Do you find in your, in your practice that you're helping people to move from a reported type on a journey to a best fit? Or, I mean, because I don't, I don't know that we arrive at true type this side of the grave. <laughs> but, you know, that actually they get the best fit for now. Because like, like you, I mean, I tested on step one Myers Briggs, INFJ, every time I did it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I did step two. Because I just, it didn't fit, it wasn't right. I did step two. And, um, came I and TJ. Yeah. But that journey for me, it was quite an interesting journey, just that. But to then look at the progression as I got older, and working out how we, uh, certainly the archetype discussion about this morning, how you actually begin to work with the stuff that you haven't really dealt with before. Yeah. I mean, do you find in your kind of counseling practice that you're helping people make that journey? So in my counseling, I don't overtly use type, I sort of use it to inform my thinking. Okay. So I'm yeah. not generally talking about them, talking about type with my clients, but I'm thinking about it all the time. Um, See, a lot of the people I get are NFJ who come into therapy to see me, and I'm qualitatively typing people, so that's the, the caveat, but um, by the time they're in my office, they're between the ages of 26 and 32, and, you know, they're in a phase of life transition, and they're having a hard time, you know, learning to do something new, because they're making a transition and they can't use the things that they've been using to get by, right, so this is where my generation gets stuck. Um, and so a lot of it is just about de developing introverted feeling and helping them figure out, you know, what are my values, how do I want to live, what's important to me, I've been living my life, calibrating myself to everything around me, and I'm lost and I don't know what to do. So it's, I'm never, I don't really, I kind of just stay with the top two and work on both attitudes of that for whatever reason. It just seems like that's where the need is for them. Um, and actually, one of the things that I've started doing is helping people. So, like, when people come in with anxiety, it's almost like introverted intuition run amok. And so, one of the ways that I help, it's kind of an in the moment tool, it's not a long term strategy, but to help them ground in the moment, I help them do like extroverted sensing, which is like mindfulness and, you know, being kind of getting out of up here and getting into it right here. So, like breathing or, you know, drinking hot tea or going for a walk or doing something sensory or bodily oriented to help unlock them from that 
kind of uh, tail chasing that they get stuck in. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been starting to use that as a strategy for helping them to learn to use the inferior function well, which is where the idea for channeling your opposite type to develop your inferior function came from. Thank you. Um, if there are any other questions, maybe you'd want to show us a couple of, you think, the most informative or interesting slides from your Miami presentation. Oh, yeah. Like it has data yeah. on it. For the people that haven't seen that. Sure. Is that the one you were thinking about? I, then I said I was going to let you choose. Okay. <laughs> no, maybe this is interesting. Yeah, so this was uh, the profiles that I found for, um, this is the subgroup, so extroverted sensation, and then that's the all together big sample, the PTD. <coughs> um, and so here's an example of the tripod with three discrete functions. And here's an example with the dominant in both attitudes and the auxiliary. Um, and then another one was sort of classic. So a lot of them were the same kind of sandwich situation where they had one dominant and either the auxiliary in both functions or the opposite of the dominant um, in the top three. And here's an example of one of the classes that didn't have an opposing inferior function, which was smaller but still significant. So the bottom one is just all extroverted sensing yeah. mm -hmm. variations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Anything interesting you guys noticed about this? <coughs> Does it change the way you think about type development at all? I mean, in terms of what's after your auxiliary, where do you go? I used to think you go to the tertiary and inferior. So this kind of changed my perspective on things. About that, but this is sort of a visual illustration. Um, this was 59% of them, uh, the auxiliary and superior were opposed in attitude, so you had opposite process, opposite attitude, so extroverted thinking with introverted sensing. And then a, a nice big chunk of them with the same attitude, so extroverted thinking with extroverted sensing. And then 11% just other wacky stuff. And then this slide is a depiction of the triad, so that's, um, sorry, the one before was uh, superior and auxiliary, and this is the triad, so superior, auxiliary, and tertiary. And so kind of similar findings here. Um, I think you had a slide that validated um, some of the work that Margaret and Gary Hartstorm had done about how that if you're extroverted as your dominant function, you tend to develop all the extroverted functions some. Hmm. And if you're introverted, and I think there was one or two, like, I mean, obviously the, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember where that was. Say the first part of that again. Uh, um, well, actually, if you go back to your, your pie graph, the, the, the one before that, or that one's probably fine, the one before that, yeah. This one? Yeah, yeah. So, in other words, so that 30% is people that, like, they might have been extroverted since seen as their dominant, but with the STP preferences, yeah. but instead of being introverted thinking, it was extroverted thinking, right? right? So you have 30% of the people that they're so extroverted, if you want to think of it that way, that they pull their, they, that they're, they're, they're even trying to use their auxiliary function in that same attitude. But uh, Margaret and Gary Hartzler's work had done a bunch of work in the date zone that pretty consistently, mm -hmm. that if you had extroversion as your dominant function, you tended to try to access all of the extroverted functions Right? Not just your dominant, you try to, or if you're introverted, you spent more time kind of touching all of your introverted functions. And so they've done a bunch of um, qualitate, uh, uh, qualitative work in that direction. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and I, I don't know actually how much, I don't know if somebody else can talk more of their qualitative work, but um, they did a whole bunch, and that's what they had discovered at a qualitative level across the board. And so this kind of data supports their qualitative discoveries. Yeah, absolutely. It's almost like, the extroversion, when it's so heavily extroverted, so heavily introverted, has a like a gravity that yes, pulls, pulls everything yes. into its orbit. Mm -hmm. There's like an outward or an inward inertia that just keeps rolling. Yes. Way. Have you broken down in that thirty percent? Is it the case that it's evenly split between the same attitude when that attitude is extroverted and the same attitude when it's introverted? Say that one more time. So, I got it. Are, are there as many? Oh, a split between. As, as each 
Interestingly, it could be a measure of the, the data, but it was mostly leaning towards E. So I had lots of E's who had lots of E versus I's who had lots of I. But again, you know, relative to the population, we have more E's anyway, so it could be an artifact of the data sample. Not, not something in the data sample. And we also live in an extraordinary culture, so. Mm -hmm. I have, have you recognized any questions that were more about problems with the phrasing of the question rather than with the data sample? Mm -hmm. rather that would be a question for Mark Majors. Um, I didn't really touch the actual assessment itself. I just okay. got the data when it came out. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was got my email about that, but it was, um, I mean, doing an assessment, like data, using data from an actual eight function assessment mm -hmm. would be what I'd love to see. And obviously Dario has got one, mm -hmm. it isn't publicised as much, but it's on the website, it's free to use. Is it? Yes. Mm -hmm. And you may have stacks of data that you can give me. <laughs> and he's at the conference, so I would suggest speaking to him. Okay. You know, you no can actually is. analyse a, a data from a question, so rather than it being worked out from a formula, yeah. Been asking questions of, and you know, Darius wrote books about defining the eight functions and things. And I've seen it. It's, you know, I think it's going to have to be quite interesting. Yeah, that's obviously the big flaw in this whole thing. Is it? <laughs> it's called <laughs> keys to cog keys to cognition dot com, where the two is a numeral. Okay. All right. So I think we'll wrap up here. Thank you guys for attending. I hope I didn't bore you with too many numbers. Um, again, just let me know if you want any of the other resources. I'm happy to send them to you. Thank you.